Hello, my name is Byron White and I am the Public Information Officer for the City of Berkeley Police Department. I'll be moderating tonight's event along with Veronica Rodriguez, Lieutenant of the Community Services Bureau. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. This is our first time having a virtual Q&A and we will have a number of people from our department to answer your questions, including our Chief of Police, Andrew Greenwood, who will be joining us a bit later, our Captain of Operations, Kevin Schofield, Traffic Division Lieutenant Randy Files, Communica Communication Center Lieutenant Peter Hong, Personnel and Training Lieutenant Mike Durbin, Community Services Bureau Lieutenant Veronica Rodriguez, Detective Sergeant Jesse Grant, Bicycle Patrol Sergeant Darren Kaselik, and Air Coordinators Alex McDougall, Jessica Perry, George Shikori, Brian Hartley, and Chris Scott. A number of you have already sent in some questions for us. And for those that wish to ask a question during the session, simply use the raise your hand Zoom function. If you have a question but don't wish to speak, you can use the Q&A Zoom chat button below. And with that, we will get started. <clears throat> One of the main topics that uh, we received from a number of you is that around wildfire safety, particularly in the hills. And uh, Captain Schofield, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that. Certainly, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, the fire safety is sort of certainly a huge concern for us. Uh, the Berkeley Police Department is actively working with mutual aid uh, and adjoining agencies to do what we can to prevent and minimize problems. Uh, recently and currently, uh, the Oakland Police Department, Oakland Fire, Berkeley Police, Berkeley Fire, East Bay Regional, uh, Contra Costa County Sheriff have all been working to address issues on the Grizzly Peak area to include uh, a number of uh, UC, uh, the University of California chopped down uh, 2,000 trees uh, as part of their fire prevention measures. So a number of those huge trunks have been placed along Grizzly Peak uh, to prevent people from parking in the cutouts. The hope is by preventing that during the fire safety season, uh, we'll have a safer area that uh, we've gotten complaints about people up doing fireworks and barbecues, things like that. So long stretches of Grizzly Peak have uh, uh, areas that are now blocked off. Uh, on red, fly, red flag fire days, the Berkeley Police Department will also deploy extra resources, whether it be parking enforcement officers into the hills to ensure uh, fire truck access if needed, uh, and also for regular Berkeley police officers just to be on high visibility patrols in case anything were to happen. Uh, we stay in communication uh, as needs arise with the East Bay Regional Parks and Oakland Police and UC Police as part of that process as well. Thank you. Uh, did anyone in the, did anyone from the audience have any questions about that. Uh, otherwise, I was going to move on to our next topic, which is around gun violence. <clears throat> um, I see in the uh, chat function here uh, that we were asked to speak about the recent fatal shootings, gun violence. For those of you who have been serving Berkeley for a long time, what have residents done in the past that really worked and what has worked best at the department level. Would any of our panelists like to chime in? <clears throat> well, uh, I see that we have our air coordinator for West Berkeley, uh, Brian Hartley, if you could say a few words. Uh, <clears throat> the most recent shooting that we've had, which was near the freeways, my understanding, which was uh, jurisdictionally for CHP, so they're handling the investigation. I tried to look into some stuff, but uh, I, BPD is not a part of that investigation. I realize there, there has been, a, seems like an uptick in the violence with the shootings. Uh, I think the question asked, asked what we've done in the past We've also, in the past, had the opportunity to uh, hire overtime 
get officers down in those areas, flood the areas uh, where there's an uptick in violence, uh, flood the streets with officers, or do different programs that has worked in the past for us. Uh, currently, we're not doing that right now currently, but we have done that in the past and it has worked. Uh, for citizens, what, what you can do to help too is we always promote and uh, push for people to, if you see anything suspicious, if uh, you see illegal activity, uh, call BPD. If it's suspicious, non-emergency line, you're gonna get someone down there. There might be a police officer right around the corner from where you live, writing a report, eating, uh, taking a snack, anything. And they could be there very quickly to deal with the issue or at least address it if it's suspicious. So we highly encourage calling the BPD. If you see anything suspicious, again, with criminal activity, call us uh, to report it. It helps with statistics to show an uptick in violence that we may not be aware of. Uh, for some, some folks that choose not to call PBD, BPD, which is, uh, it's, you know, to each their own. If you don't want to call, we totally get it. Uh, but it does help. So being an electronic age, if you call, it's documented. We can show for area coordinators, there's a uptick in crime or there's these certain things happening in this area and we can address it with special programs, sending officers down there. Uh, we're starting to get our bike unit going again as well. So we have some other programs that we're, we are doing and we can send those officers down to certain areas to do projects and try to try to address uh, violence or other crimes that are going in, in that area. Uh, trying to read if there's anything else, uh, unless someone else would like to uh, chime in as well. I'll read some of the comments or questions. Yeah, so just to add to that, uh, yes, we we have had a number of shootings this year. Uh, we had the one, of course, that Brian Hartley mentioned that happened uh, near the freeway, which was under CHB's jurisdiction. And we also had that one that was on 8th Street. Um, one of the questions here, um, are any of the cases related? This is this gang related? Any updates? Uh, some of us don't feel safe in our neighborhoods. Uh, anytime there's a shooting or some some act of violence, our detectives follow up on that, and and they try and see if any of the cases are related. Uh, we do have a member from our detective division here. Perhaps uh, Jesse Grant, if you could just talk a little bit, just in general about uh, some of the investigations and how they play out, and if we have uh, communication with other jurisdictions. Uh, well, Byron, what I would say, so it's, uh, our little homicide unit handles those uh, directly, and they've actually been very successful lately in putting some of those cases together. It's hard to speak to uh, many of these ongoing investigations uh, while they're still in process. I will say, just to sort of put a, uh, the big picture, larger context on it, there's been an uptick, but we're coming up off of what are really historic lows when it comes to uh, the gun violence. So I think keeping that in mind, but uh, absolutely our homicide unit is working uh, diligently to determine who the perpetrators are and uh, arrest them. And if I may add something, um, uh, there was a comment in the chat in the, the very uh, um, uh, valuable comment. Uh, yes, our, we can be confident to know that our homicide unit is, will, is probably likely interfacing with CHP uh, to, to work, work the investigation together. We may not know it, but the group in, the, in this meeting today right now may not know, may not have the further information, but I'm pretty confident they have additional information that they're sharing, CHP sharing, CHP sharing information as well. Because again, it's not, it's a small group of people who's causing this violence. And uh, we can confidently also say it is not random. Um, unfortunately, those who were shot at were likely targeted for whatever reason. And so uh, that's the kind of general atmosphere of what the shooting is all about. All right. Um, so I, I see a question here. Uh, can you let us know about what each of your job descriptions are? So we. Right in the beginning, we did. Uh, I just gave like a, a brief overview, but um, 
perhaps we could all just go around the room. I'll start with myself. I'm Byron White. I'm the public information officer with the city. And uh, Veronica. You have to, yeah. Uh, so I'm Acting Lieutenant Veronica Rodriguez. Uh, nobody calls me Veronica, though. Feel free to call me Ronnie. Um, I currently oversee the Community Services Bureau. Um, our bureau is comprised of the Public Information Officer, Byron White, <clears throat> excuse me, in addition to four area coordinators and uh, one Community Service Bureau Officer, Christopher Scott. Um, so in addition to being responsible for a lot of the community engagement within the city, we're also responsible for the resolution of long-term problems and uh, quality of life issues within the community. Uh, if Peter, I Peter Hong, if you want to give an introduction. Hello, good evening. My name is uh, Lieutenant Peter Hong and I oversee the Berkeley Police and Fire Communication Center. So we dispatch, obviously, the police uh, uh, side of things, but we also do dispatch uh, fire, the fire department, as well as emergency medical services. Uh, we have a staff of about 40, I'm sorry, 24, 24 dispatchers with uh, four supervising dispatchers, along with myself. And um, we're a 24-7 operation. Uh, and uh, we also answer the non-emergency calls for service as well as, as, well as the 911 call for service. All right, uh, Lieutenant Files. Hello everyone, I'm Lieutenant Randy Files. I oversee the Traffic Bureau, um, which in our department is comprised of the traffic officers, those who you see on the motorcycles, uh, whose primary job is to enforce traffic and go to serious injury collisions and fatal collisions. That's our, uh, that's our purview. We handle that. I also um, lead the uh, parking enforcement section. Uh, those are the people who you see in the go fours, which most people call scooters, um, who enforce parking regulations throughout the city and as a result uh, are citywide uh, throughout the day. Um, they also pride themselves on being force multipliers when uh, the fire season hits. Uh, they often do ancillary duties uh, of fire patrol and uh, other things throughout to support patrol. When patrol has a major incident, uh, PEOs are there to help. Uh, Lieutenant Mike Durbin. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Mike Durbin. I oversee the Personnel and Training Bureau of the Berkeley Police Department. So we handle all of the hiring and all the training of all of our officers and personnel. We are currently at about 164, 165 police officers. We're authorized 164. I can't remember where we're at right now, but we're authorized 164. We might be a one off that number right now. And we have about 100 uh, non-sworn uh, staff that uh, support the, uh, the public safety goals. And so that's anything from dispatchers, as Lieutenant Hong mentioned, to uh, parking enforcement officers, as Lieutenant Files mentioned, to the jailers, to crime scene technicians. Uh, I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out here uh, as well. But uh, uh, in terms of training, uh, it's everything that is pushed on us from the state and from the legislature, as well as the community desires that see us train in certain areas, as well as the general orders that are laid out by the chief. Um, Jesse Grant. Good evening. I'm Sergeant Jesse Grant. I supervise the sexual assault and domestic violence unit. Uh, our responsibility here in our uh, three detective unit is monitoring uh, sexual offenders in the city, uh, obviously investigating uh, sexual assault and domestic violence crimes. And uh, currently we're we just were awarded a grant to uh, handle a bunch of sexual assault related evidence. So we're sort of looking back at cold cases and uh, beginning to sort of reopen those and uh, examine additional evidence. All right, uh, uh, Captain Schofield. Hey again, everybody. Again, my name is Kevin Schofield. The police department is made up of four separate divisions. 
I'm the acting captain of the operations division. It's the biggest of the four divisions that encompasses uh, the seven patrol teams, the seven teams of patrol officers that cover the city of Berkeley 24 hours a day. It encompasses the Community Services Bureau, as Sergeant Rodriguez mentioned, which includes the PIO, uh, the bicycle detail led by uh, Sergeant Kaselik. Uh, and also under the umbrella of the operations division is the bomb unit and the SWAT team. So it's a very large span as well as the police reserves. All right, uh, Alex McDougall. Thanks, Byron. Um, so I'm Alex McDougall. I'm one of the area coordinators. We have four area coordinators. Each of them covers like about a quarter of the city. And where I guess everyone has a beat officer that covers sort of a smaller slice of their neighborhood. We cover a larger slice of the neighborhood and handle ongoing issues, uh, community outreach, and a lot of coordinating of problem solving stuff that isn't necessarily traditional police work, but that's still a community concern. And we work with uh, like other city offices to get those problems solved. Jessica Perry. Hi, I'm Jessica Perry. I'm the area coordinator for South Berkeley. Uh, so I work directly with um, as a liaison for UC and then I work with our local business districts such as the Telegraph Business District and deal with any other ongoing um, neighborhood or issues within South, Ber South Berkeley. Georgia Perry. Hi, I'm George Shikori, um, the area coordinator uh, for District 3 in Berkeley, which uh, is downtown and parts of South Berkeley. And my partners have explained already basically what, uh, what our task is. Thanks. Uh, Brian Hartley. Yep, thank you, Byron. Uh, same thing that George said, the other three have already said what we do. Uh, I'm the area four coordinator which is everything west of San Pablo from border to border. So from Albany to Emeryville, everything west of San Pablo, including the marina. That's my area. Chris Scott. Hi, I'm Officer Chris Scott, a former Area 4 coordinator, currently assigned to Community Service Bureau, focusing on uh, trying to bolster the department's crime prevention programs. And Darren Kaselik. I'm Sergeant Darren Kasalik. I'm in charge of our uh, new bike team. Uh, I have six officers that work for me. And uh, we basically concentrate in the areas of downtown Shattuck uh, and Telegraph, um, dealing with like street level crimes in progress stuff. Um, and then just getting out on our bikes and you know concentrating on citizen contacts and looking for any anything at that street level. Uh, some people that are going through stuff uh, mentally. Uh, hopefully we're a first line of defense to, to uh, interact with them and see if they need help or uh, need to be moved along. That's essentially what we do. Okay, I think that was everyone. The chief may be joining us a bit later this evening. Um, I see that there's a number of questions here. And again, everyone, if, if you like to speak, you can go ahead and use the uh, Raise your hand icon and uh, we will call on you uh, for comments. But I see that there's no hands raised. So um, there's, let's see. <clears throat> One of the questions we had earlier was about catalytic converter thefts. Um, I saw that um, Alex, you know, Alex Mazugal chimed in a bit about it in the uh, in the comments section. Is there anything you wanted to add more about that, Alex? Um, I don't think so. I think, I mean, to that question about how do you combat a specific crime problem, one of the things I, I have noticed in my career is that uh, our crime is sort of increasingly regional and that uh, some of the people you arrest, it turns out that they live in Berkeley and a lot of them, it turns out they live in other cities. Um, when I was a detective working in sort of fraud and, and then in burglary, 
which included commercial burglaries. I had a series that they targeted the Lululemon store and this crew ranged up and down the state. I mean, they would go out in the morning to do burglaries and they would do, one day they did Fresno and San Jose and Corte Madera all in one stretch. Um, so I think that does connect back also to uh, the question that was asked earlier about specifically about some of the violent crime, but that led to the, uh, us describing the coordination we have. And I think that's one of the big strengths in law enforcement today is that we, we do have a lot of information sharing. We do coordinate with our neighboring agencies. Uh, in my experience, that works pretty well. Um, so to catalytic converters, I think um, our patrol guys have um, been doing really good work and making a lot of arrests. Um, but I, I think there is also a lot of coordination on the investigative side to sort of address the other aspects of it, whether it's kind of from a prevention side and putting out information about how to harden your car, harden the target, um, or about uh, tracking down where the material goes. All right. I see that there is a hand raised. Um, so uh, caller, I'm going to allow you to talk and then you will have to unmute yourself to begin. Hi, um, are, are there certain things you guys are doing to be more community oriented? Since Berkeley's not too much of a small town and obviously I live in district two. Um, <laughs> Sorry, my dog. I noticed in I noticed working in San Francisco, the police are more community oriented and seem to wave at the people and know the people more, the community more. But I don't notice that with you guys. So is there anything other than coffee with the cop? I don't think it's a good idea because you just meet with the sergeant. And if you were to ever get pulled over or deal with something, it most likely won't be the sergeant to show up. So I think that the San Francisco cops are very community oriented and friendly. Is there anything you're, you guys are doing to be friendly to the community? Well, uh, so on the call, we have uh, Veronica Rodriguez from Community Service, but I just also like to add uh, our coffee with the cops that, of course, we, we can't have them right now during this pandemic, but when we've had them in the past, it's not just been supervisors who've shown up, it's also been patrol officers as well. And, um, we just recently started our bicycle patrol unit and uh, Sergeant Casella is here. Um, he can talk a little bit more about that, but uh, one, of, one of the benefits to having a patrol like that is that there is more individual interaction with the officer because they're on a bicycle, they're uh, riding the street close to the sidewalk and they're just mo simply moving at a slower pa pace and they're able to check in with a lot of the local businesses and people who regularly travel through our commercial districts. But um, if, Ronnie, if you had anything you wanted to follow up with. Difficult for us to um, do any type of community engagement, particularly right now um, during the time of COVID and social distancing. Um, <clears throat> We love to at some point get back to uh, coffee with the cop and other community engagement type events. I know we often did a lot of community engagement um, during our special events. The city does host a ton of special events um, and often our cops are out there. Um, and it is incredibly difficult for a lot of our cops to, to kind of, you know, they could wave, they could certainly wave, but oftentimes they're, you know, in route to calls or in the process of going from call to call and don't necessarily have the time or opportunity to, uh, to interact with our folks. But I did want to ask, was there anything that you had in mind or, you know, any type of concepts that uh, you would like to see from us? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, one thing is I know that with San Francisco, I think it's a little different because some of the cops parents like own restaurants and have, they might not live there, but their parents live there. And so they just know the community more in the district I work in. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, sometimes just like, if you see the same person over and over again, walking by, maybe say hello and smile at them. Uh, I'd never seen a Berkeley cop do that. And I'm 34 and I lived here all my life. So, <laughs> but they do that in San Francisco. Um, they'll wave at you and smile at you and they don't do that in Berkeley. 
another thing is, is that I've been pulled over like last year so many times because I was tired because I was working about 80 hours a, a week and I'm not really equipped to do that type of thing. But I always got warnings in San Francisco, but I never got a warning in Berkeley um, because they just said, you know, just be careful. We care about you. Just be careful. But in Berkeley, it's like, let me come down hard on you. You need to learn type thing. So maybe just recognizing like sometimes people make mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> All right. Uh... Hey, Byron, if I could just add something to that. Yes. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, whoever, whoever that was that was just speaking, the community member, but uh, we, I think we are engaged. We, we've, uh, I know the sergeant had mentioned community events, but we've done Solano Stroll. Uh, we have many other community events where we set up booths and we're, we're engaging with the community. Uh, I was a former bicycle officer for, uh, for a couple of years downtown. And I will tell you as a bicycle officer downtown, uh, many times I would just park the bike and I would walk around. So we were, we were on a first name basis with pretty much all the business owners on Shattuck as well as Telegraph. And uh, there'd be a lot of waving and smiling. And I guess I didn't pull you over because I'm the king of warnings. I give a lot of warnings. So I guess I didn't, uh, I didn't catch you. But um, we were engaging with folks on social media. Uh, I think we're on every platform there is now. Um, and again, we've done community meetings, many community meetings uh, in the past. Uh, neighborhood watch groups, we're sending officers out to those. Obviously with the pandemic right now, we can't do that. Uh, that's why we're doing things like this. But uh, maybe it's just because San Francisco has maybe, I think they're up to 2,500 officers. And as the Lieutenant said earlier, we're, we're at about 160 something. So maybe that's why you, you just don't see as many Berkeley officers. But I just wanted to chime in and let you know that we, we do do a lot of community events, including National Night Out, which unfortunately we had to postpone. All right. So let's see, Fred? and then Shelly after. Okay, here I am. I sent in the question about catalytic converters uh, because we have two Priuses or Pri, I don't know. And um, we've had them hardened, but it's a, almost impossible to catch the thugs in the act because it's quick. They're being sold somewhere and it's a regional problem. They're not sold in Berkeley, but someone is buying a ton of catalytic converters. How do we go after them? Because that's how to stop the traffic. You, since you can't really stop the thugs who are stealing them. Question. Uh, 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 Jesse Grant, if, you, if there's a, perhaps some points you can add or um, Alex McDougall. Um, I mean, in my limited understanding of it, and I can certainly reach out to our property, property crime sergeant and, and try and get you a more detailed answer, but I certainly know um, frequently those are going to recycling centers uh, and, you know, those are across the region. So I think um, one of the barriers there to addressing that maybe on a larger scale is just having the regional uh, coordination for that. But I can, I can certainly reach out to our property crime sergeant, Fred, if, uh, and get you a more detailed answer. I'll, uh, I'll put my email in the, in the comments if you'd like. All right. <clears throat> so Shelly is next. You are now able to speak. So if you just go ahead and un unmute yourself. Oh, wait a minute. No, I think I actually, so PM you're allowed to go ahead and speak if you had your hand raised. Um, I'd like to go back to the fireworks problem. On the 4th of July, South Berkeley has, especially along the Oakland border, has a huge problem. And I've lived here for 23 years and I have never managed to get anybody from the BPD to respond. And um, it's really a big problem. This past year, they set a fire that we had to put out. 
so it would be really nice if there was somebody next 4th of July along that area that just came down in a cop car and started issuing citations because it's just not going to stop. It used to be guns. Now at least it's just fireworks. So it's a real big problem for us. And we'd really like some attention to that problem. And it goes on for three and a half, four hours straight. They don't move. It's not like they set them off and run. So um, I know it, it's not that way in other parts of Berkeley, but it is here and we, we really need something done. I didn't catch the location that uh, PM if you if it's it's it seems to center along um, the area at along Alcatraz and Adeline that area um, there's there just over the the part of Martin Luther King ex actually is not in Oakland. It's, it's that area as well. It's up from Martin Luther King on 62nd Street, on 61st Street. Um, the same households year after year. There's a person across um, on Martin Luther King that shoots them across the BART tracks, um, is aiming them across the BART tracks, you know, is attempting to hit cars. And I can't get anybody to come and deal with it. And they, they did set a fire this year and I, we had to deal with it. And when I called in to uh, the non-emergency number after we set the fire off, they truthfully, they acted like it was a joke. And it's not a joke, it's a big serious problem. So, and we are part of Berkeley and we pay Berkeley taxes. So we'd really like something done this coming year and something, some citations issued. I mean, these are not little sparklers. These are um, massive, massive fireworks. And I took pictures and sent them to the city manager, et cetera. I mean, these are, these are, and, and the other thing is, is that the big problem is, is that nobody's attacking the suppliers and stopping them from selling in this state. And I keep trying to escalate that even up to the governor, but in a state racked by drought, there should not be fireworks. So um, I, really, I'd like to see somebody next, next year, 4th of July, along that corridor. I've never once in 23 years, multiple calls every 4th of July, gotten an officer to respond. And I'm, I know that there's other things going on, other crimes, but that is a crime and it's, it's, it's a big detriment to this area. So it would be nice if the city, the city used to say, oh, we're all down at the marina doing crowd control. Well, that certainly wasn't the problem this year because there were no marina fireworks. So I'd really like to see somebody down here. Yes, uh, certainly. We agree that uh, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem throughout the city. And, and you're right, during Fourth of July in the past, when we have had some fireworks uh, performances, it has been a challenge for us throughout the city. Um, that said, we do appreciate when you do call and we respond to them as best we can, as quickly as we can. Um, but uh, there's also a high volume workload. Perhaps in the future, uh, we can see about, you know, if there's the ability or the funding for additional staffing but um, it is something that uh, we will discuss and see what we can improve on for the future. Yeah, if I, may, if I may interject, Byron, just real quick. Yes. Um, so thank you for uh, bringing those uh, concerns to our attention. Um, I was unaware of the, the volume, the, um, the volume of the issues that are occurring in that particular area. So part of my responsibilities in the Community Services Bureau is to also uh, oversee a lot of the special events and staffing for those special events. Um, currently, in addition to staffing the marina for potential crowd control issues, we also um, routinely send cops up to Panoramic. So right. um, this is certainly at you know in a point where we may also consider, like Officer White was mentioning, um, increase additional staffing to include the Alcatraz Adeline corridor. Um, I would also encourage you to um, touch base with your area coordinator, Jessica Perry, who's also on this call, 
she'd be also happy to follow up with you, um, you know, regarding kind of specific details and being able to get more uh, information from you about the potential suppliers, um, the sellers of the illegal fireworks within that area. I have no idea who those are, um, but I do know I can point out the, you know, if somebody comes down the 4th of July, it's very easy. It's the same houses over and over again. And unfortunately now, um, because I live in the area border, bordering the BART tracks on the east side, and there's that cutoff section of Martin Luther King there, we had 10 young guys pull up in two cars loaded with fireworks to set them off. And they weren't from our neighborhood. So that's, that's an easy bust right there. That's an easy thing to stop. Um, and that they set the fire. But thank you. I, I will follow up um, with Miss Perry. Officer Perry. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I see another hand raised. Uh, Miss Mandel. Shelly Mandel? Yes, hello? Yes. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, first, uh, thanks you guys. I think you do a very good job and I've attended coffee with cops a couple of times, thought it was very productive. I live in uh, the area just south of campus, Dwight and Dana since the 1980s. There's a constant parade of characters that just are not right in their mind. They're violent. They're unpredictable, they're loud, they're intimidating. What, what can be done about this? It's, it's uh, I think it's getting worse or, or, and or I'm getting older and I'm not feeling confident even to take a walk around my block. Byron, I could take this one. Um, hi, Shelly. It's uh, Officer Jessica Perry. So um, I just wanted to, I, I saw your comment in the chat as well in regards to um, the ongoing issues in your area. So I actually today spent a few hours on um, Dana, more so towards Dana and Parker in regards to some ongoing issues we've had with subjects in your area. So I, I understand your frustrations and I do understand that we have a lot of foot traffic that goes from um, down Dwight. So you have a lot of subjects that are going from Shattuck to Telegraph and they tend to walk down Dwight. So I'm sure you're seeing that on a regular basis. Um, but we are trying to work with as many local services as we can in regards to any mental health issues with subjects in that area. So just to give you an example, um, today I, I've received ongoing complaints in regards to a subject that was in your neighborhood. Um, and I contacted neighborhood services along with our uh, mobile crisis team. And together we all went out there to speak to some of the individuals that were in your area. Um, that's just one example of kind of how we're trying to um, deal with the issues in your area. Um, but the first thing I can say going back to that is that we're not informed of the issues if people don't call. And often I'm dealing with people in your area that don't necessarily want to call the police, but they want the situation handled or they're upset that it didn't get handled. But then when I go back to try to track the call or track ongoing issues within the area, I don't have any calls for service from the neighborhood. So I would definitely encourage you and your neighbors to please contact us and you can feel free to contact me directly. Um, patrol is going to be who you're going to want to contact if it's an ongoing, you know, a current issue that's going on. That would be our non-emergency number, but for a constant issue that you're having, such as, you know, a specific location in the neighborhood or a homeless subject on your porch um, or any anything such as that, you can feel free to contact me directly. And we do come out and we try to mitigate those problems the best we can. So uh, if, if I'm being heard, how, how do I do that? Yes, I call the non-emergency number 981-5900 um, often. Sometimes you're woken up in the middle of the night by a, what we call the screamers, but then they move on and you're looking through your window. You, you don't oftentimes get a good description, but uh, again, I, I understand that everybody has rights, even those who don't fully understand that responsibility goes along with that. 
I'm, I'm just wondering, are there community service officers that can be added to the, um, to the staffing? This is a constant, as you well know, a constant problem in this neighborhood that mm -hmm. people just want to come in and enjoy what's going on. People have no other place to go. A lot of students leave this area with all their furniture outside, which is a perfect place for these guys to, to camp out for several weeks at a time. Yeah, so there's a, there's a few different things that you can do. Um, I think all of the area coordinators, we can probably put our information in the chat um, if that would be helpful. Um, so in the middle of the night, you're obviously not gonna reach your area coordinators. That's gonna be something that you are gonna have to contact the non-emergency line. But I want you to know that if it is something and you do um, advise non-emergency that this is an ongoing complaint, a lot of the times the patrol officers that respond, if they see that it is constant, um, such as those beat officers in your area are pretty familiar with the ongoing issues. They do usually advise the area coordinators so that we're aware of the situ situation and then we can handle it accordingly. You know, people screaming randomly walking down the street, it is going to be a tough one no matter what you do because you're going to contact the police department and by the time an officer responds, if they weren't sitting right on your street, that subject has probably walked numerous blocks away and is not going to be in the area when they get there. Um, but during the day or your more constant issues or if you're seeing the same subjects that's something that we can definitely assist you with further thank you i see that you also asked about uh, what progress if any has been made toward hiring community service officers who can handle nonviolent crimes so i just i just like to talk about that just for a moment i know that uh, the city's been having a whole conversation about reimagining the police department and how, how we respond to calls. Um, so that conversation hasn't, uh, hasn't completed or that process isn't, isn't done yet. Um, we do have community service officers right now who uh, assist us inside the department uh, in, our, in our jail and uh, with the ID techs. Um, Mike Durbin, if, uh, if you could talk just a little bit about uh, staffing and where we are with, um, so I know we have a number of open positions throughout the department. Yes, so uh, several months ago, hiring was frozen in, in the city. We were actually very close to being uh, fully staffed or on our way to being fully staffed in all of our classifications, including the community service officer position. And uh, whoever posed that question, you're, you're absolutely right. We were looking at and hopeful that uh, we would expand the uh, community service officer positions and uh, expand them in numbers and expand their, their responsibilities. But uh, uh, obviously we all know in the last uh, six months, eight months now, um, everything that uh, we were striving for has been put on hold and we're putting uh, public, uh, public health at, at the front right now. And we also realized too that uh, We've absorbed a lot of additional costs that I don't think we could have possibly seen come our way uh, 10 months ago. And so that means that uh, we have frozen positions. Community service officer is still frozen. We won't be hiring for that. We were only down one. We had a person that uh, we, uh, we had backgrounded and we were uh, anticipating giving a job offer, offer to. We have now just recently are uh, in conversations with human resources and the city manager, and this is the, the chief, obviously, where we're gonna start uh, looking at hiring, but that's not gonna get us up to where we were hoping to go 10 months ago. That's just gonna keep us sustaining the level where we're at right now. So every, uh, every position that we hire for has quite a, quite a uh, learning curve or training period. You know, officer is, uh, when we looked, it takes about 15 months from the time we start talking about uh, a recruitment process to the time that a officer is actually solo and filling a, filling a beat or taking an assignment. A dispatcher can be about a year. Uh, community service officers and parking enforcement are, uh, are quicker, but uh, we have to prioritize right now for sure. Okay, did, th did that answer your question? Question, Ms. Mandel? Yeah, 
uh, well, yeah, sort of. I understand uh, hiring and budgets are tough. Yes, thank you. Okay. We also have a question here I see in the comments about uh, about, well, I just saw it. <laughs> there was a question about uh, video surveillance cameras and I was going to ask if Chris, if you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry, Byron, I didn't see the actual question, but just to the general topic of security cameras, um, I highly, highly recommend that really all residents in this day and age should have some sort of residential sec security camera. Um, I probably go a little, little little uh, overboard at, at my house but I've, I've tried you know three different brands and I kind of I kind of stuck with one that I like and uh, you know a lot of them are, are wireless now they're super easy to install and uh, you know there's very minimal monthly fees in fact the one I use uh, doesn't have any monthly fees um, and you know when there's motion at your whether it's your front door or your side yard or your backyard you'll get an alert on your phone really quick and so again, they're super cheap, super easy to install. But many of them are wireless, um, and you know I don't see why why every resident doesn't doesn't have one, especially with you know property crimes, the way they are in Berkeley. Uh, on that topic, just real quick, I'll just say uh, you know I don't know if a lot of residents know this, but you know in Berkeley we have about 50 to 70 burglaries every month um, on average. And we're not making it very uh, hard on, on that for the criminals because at least half of those generally, uh, no force was used. In other words, they're getting in through unlocked windows or unlocked doors. So residents, please lock your doors, lock your windows, do the simple things. Don't leave your garage door opener in your car because if your car gets broken into, they just click the garage door opener and then now they have access to your garage like my neighbor experienced uh, last month. It was a tough lesson. Don't leave house keys in your car. Uh, things like that. Just basic things, you know, just common sense things. But anyway, back to security cameras. If you're looking for something a little bit more high end, uh, HD, you know, high resolution uh, with like a DVR recording capability, um, you know, you can get those at, you know, Fry's Electronics or even Best Buy. I think, you know, decent systems run in the area between three, four, five hundred dollars. Um, but again, the one I have was, I think, you know, 50 bucks on Amazon and it's all cloud based. And so uh, if anyone has any specific, uh, you know, questions related to that, or I could, I can't, you know, we're not really allowed to give recommendations for specific companies, but it's not hard to go out there and just, just check. So, um, but I'm happy to, uh, you know, share my email address with you. And if you guys have any more questions about security cameras or anything like that. I think there was a presentation that we put together a while back that kind of talks about some of the characteristics of security cameras and what you're looking for. And so I could share that with you guys if, if you email me. All right. Thank you, Byron. So. If I could add something. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> to uh, kind of piggyback on what Officer Scott was mentioning, <clears throat> excuse me, um, our department also offers and just introduced last year the security camera registry program which is available through our website. And we would encourage all of our community members to register their security cameras if and when they install them. Um, Cause they come uh, incredibly handy and incredibly useful for our investigators. And I don't know if uh, Detective Sergeant Jesse Grant is able to speak to any cases in which they've been able to use the security cameras um, that were registered to help or assist in any of their cases. <clears throat> Sorry about that, LT. I was actually typing to Brian, who had a, uh, a camera-related question. So yeah, we we absolutely uh, solve cases or get um, very significant evidence from video surveillance. I mean, it's really um, key in many of our felony investigations. Uh, and uh, one of I think Brian's question was how we receive it. Uh, very frequently, we can make arrangements to show up at the homeowners residents and uh, get the video via um, thumb drive and 
you know, if it's, if it's small enough, sometimes email or use like a Dropbox type uh, situation if, if we need to do this remotely. But uh, yeah, those are usually the, the easiest ways to, to receive it. And we really, really appreciate the help from citizens with, with the video. And, and the more that people feel comfortable putting up systems, um, yeah, that's a, that's a huge boon for public safety. All right. I also see we have a question about uh, speeders. Can you please issue more speeding tickets on residential streets? Lots of speeders on Channing Way between San Pablo Avenue and Sacramento. Lots of young bikers and kids running around. Uh, Lieutenant Files. Uh, Seeing can... that question. Yes, thank you, Byron. Seeing that question, I've already noted that. I will promise you that we will have someone out there uh, with LIDAR shortly to, to see what we can do about this. Um, it's four, I, currently I have four officers for the whole city, so you may see them for a while and they may not come back for a while because they're going to address another issue similar to this, but we, once we put something on our radar, uh, it stays there and we have a tendency to rotate back, so we'll be, we'll be there shortly. And I'm sorry, what is, for those who don't know, what, what is LIDAR? LIDAR is what most people call radar, but it's basically laser and it's uh, a lot more specific. I can put a LIDAR on a, on a windshield or on a license plate or a front bumper of a car and get a lot more precise reading than I can with a, a broad spectrum radar. Um, it's just a more, it's a, a more accurate device in which to measure speed. And uh, how would, uh, if people have other traffic related com uh, complaints of areas, how do, they, uh, how do they let us know? Call 510-981-5980. That's the uh, main line into the traffic bureau. And uh, my administrative assistant will take down those complaints and hand them to my sergeant and we make sure that they get handled. We also can address any parking issues you have. Uh, understand that as we tell many people, we cannot solve a homeless problem via parking, but we can uh, address many other issues uh, with, through parking regulations. All right. I see uh, one of the people that wrote in I uh, had a question about Adeline and Alcatraz area. Are there any officers on patrol in a district surrounding Adeline and Alcatraz or do officers only respond to calls? I rarely see a police car in our neighborhood, yet there is a lot of crime. There is a constant problem with men panhandling in the intersection of Adeline and Alcatraz, walking in front of cars and between cars, holding up traffic flow on the left turn lanes, standing in front of cars after the light has changed glaring at me through my car window when I refuse to open my window. Um, when I reported this to the non-emergency number, they said I should give my name and indicate if I was willing to go to court to convict the person, what is going on with this? So I thought perhaps uh, Jessica Perry could talk just a little bit about the Adeline Alcatraz area. I believe that's your area. And then, um, Lieutenant Hong, if you could talk just a bit about um, uh, the calls that enter the comp, comp center. Yeah, thanks, Byron. Um, yeah, so we are very familiar with the intersection um, over there and with the constant, specifically uh, one subject constantly panhandling in the area. Um, patrol does receive numerous calls for service in regards to those subjects. Um, oftentimes, by the time they get out there, um, the subject has kind of moved or a lot of times um, in these types of situations, we're seeing these guys, they usually walk away when they see the police car coming. Um, they do try to contact them accordingly and warn them um, or issue them a citation as necessary, depending on the circumstances that are involved. Um, I am aware of it. I, we do have some other issues uh, specifically in that area um, and in the neighboring businesses that we are currently working on and we're trying to work with businesses to come up with some more long-term solutions. Hey, um, for the uh, person posing the question, uh, Byron, could you repeat the uh, citizen's arrest portion of it again, please? Uh, when this person reported the, to the Berkeley non-emergency number, they said I should give my name and indicate if I was willing to go to court to convict the person, what is going on with this? So 
without trying to condense a very complex uh, uh, reason for it, um, the police cannot cite an individual for misdemeanor or arrest an individual for misdemeanor without the aid of a, of a community member. Meaning we are, unless we actually see the crime occur in front of us, if the crime, if we see a crime occur in front of us, we can take action. However, if the crime occurred uh, and a community member saw it, reported it, or a store owner says, this is a perfect example, it happens all the time. I have a uh, unhoused person uh, in my doorway. I'm trying to open my business, and uh, they're refusing to uh, leave my leave my property. We take the call. Our dispatchers take the call, and a call for service, and then they follow up with the question, which you're, which you're, which, which is what you're posing, which is, they ask, are you will you be making willing to make a citizen's arrest if the person refuses to? Leave? Because what our officer will do is we'll go there, and ask this individual to leave the doorway area so that the business owner can open the business. Well, if the, if the individual refuses, well, the officer does not have the authority to arrest. And uh, we will not, we cannot arrest unless we have the business owner willing to make a citizen's arrest. Um, uh, otherwise, we, ha we have no authority to uh, force that person to leave. Um, Again, uh, for the person who poses this question, if you have any follow-up questions, please do so. That's kind of the general um, idea of why a citizen's arrest uh, question is being posed, because we, we cannot, we don't want to be placed in a uh, situation where we uh, we are taking action when we're not supposed to, and we're also trying to avoid having to take action which will lead to some sort of use of force, because uh, oftentimes it's the unpredictable situations that our officers face. And even a simple um, unhoused person in a doorway uh, refusing to leave, depending on the circumstances, uh, it could lead to an unpredictable, uh, unpredicted use of force situation, which we will obviously want to avoid the best we can. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I, I think we have a hand raised here. Uh, Ms. Bauer, you are you're now able to talk. Okay, thank you. Second time. Um, so what I'm wondering is with um, that situation I do notice in my apartment building, um, sometimes they've actually like came into the apartment building on the public balcony. Um, I live on Addison Street and 4th. Um, so what if, so you're not, a, so if I were to just make a call but I don't wanna be around there when an officer is, comes um, and I don't want to hang out at the area and wait for the officer when they try to force their way into the apartment building um, would I still be able to just on the phone say you know please move him and if he doesn't move go ahead and give him a citation unfortunately the law requires that you do be present and uh, uh, that you sign a form attesting that you want this person arrested because they are refusing to move on your request or refusing to leave on your request. And even when the officer has asked that person to they're refusing to, uh, to, to move. And again, we can't just forcibly move people. We have to have legal authority to do so. And that legal authority is arrest, unfortunately. Uh, it's, a note, it's going to be an arrest, and the arrest cannot happen without the community member's involvement and them making a citizen's arrest because they require the property, and it's them that are, are wanting to make, uh, to make, to have that arrest be made. I hope that answers the question. Is that, is them blocking our door considered a uh, private property when, you know, like maybe the sidewalk, the, which the door they're blocking, but I can't get out? <laughs> Well, um, if, they're, if they're blocking your door enough so that you can't even open your door, they have, they have, uh, cut, they have crossed the threshold from being a private property, from public property to private property. However, if they're on a public sidewalk, not within the curtilage of your property and not blocking your drive doorway, uh, they're not on private property. They're on, they're on public property. Okay. And may I ask a second question about the future? 
uh, with Berkeley cops, um, you could totally say this is too much of a question and refuse to answer it. Um, but uh, a lot of my friends and some people that work at the stores just kind of have always felt like Berkeley in West Berkeley and in South Berkeley have kind of been not a priority for the police, not necessarily that it's the police's fault, maybe the council members and the mayors just want the police to be around the UC. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, oh, the UC gets, makes all this money and so the police have to be around UC. So in, in a situation with defunded cops, are you gonna just put the priority around the UC and forget about South Berkeley and West Berkeley? Because I mean, people have felt that way for years that it's just always been somewhat of a rejected area. Um, and I was also wondering, you know, with the defunded cops, well, the UC already has their cops and they have a lot of their police. Do you guys need to constantly be over there? Because there's times when I went over there to get ice cream and I see the cops constantly, the city of Berkeley cops constantly patrolling the UC, but I don't see them. I, when I used to live in South Berkeley, I never saw them in South Berkeley. I never saw, I don't see them enough in West Berkeley, but it seems like the city of Berkeley is always around the UC. Um, have have can you at some point advocate for you guys to be around South Berkeley and West Berkeley? Because even though we're not UC students, we're residents and we pay our taxes. You know. Yeah. So, Miss Bauer, if I if I could just answer just a little bit. Um, uh, so, our our department has a number of police beats through the city, where an officer is assigned to each area. Um, so during our peak period from 11 to 2 a.m., uh, we'll have upwards of 20 cops, uh, somewhere around that number, um, as well as our supervisors. <clears throat> Again, it's our peak period. So um, as we get calls in and officers get tied up, uh, they may have to go back to the station and write the report or take care of what other matters, if there's, a, if there's a particular critical incident, it will require more than one officer. Um, so I think that um, it, it would be great if we had additional staffing. Um, at one point we had larger, I'm sorry, smaller police beats. Now you may recall a number of years ago, uh, we introduced a survey where we asked uh, the community if they wanted, um, if they would prefer a, uh, a larger beat that was always covered or smaller beats where there would be open beats. Uh, the the uh, response that we received back was that people preferred larger beats. So that's kind of where we are today. Um, I can tell you that um, perhaps a few years ago, our, our numbers, well, we've, we've been going, for, and, and Lieutenant Turner could talk more about this, but we've been going from somewhere from one, 150 with the goal of being at 181 where we are today uh, our goal is much lower than that uh, just given recent events at some point though um you know could you guys recognize that the uc do have their cops and maybe try to stop being over there so much because they do the uc uh, berkeley has a lot of police um, they have their, their cops, they have their protection, maybe come over to South Berkeley and West Berkeley. Uh, so uh, there is an officer that is assigned to the South campus area, a lot of the university's jurisdiction, there's some overlap. You know, they are responsible, the university is responsible for all properties of the University of California. So those residential halls uh, and those classrooms that are within this city's jurisdiction, you're gonna see university police in that area. However, the city of Berkeley also has a responsibility for the streets and the sidewalks and the businesses in that area as well. So we will have coverage there. You, you may also find that uh, perhaps on Thursday, Friday or Saturday nights on days where there are on, I'm sorry, on nights where there's a lot of students out or people shopping, eating at restaurants, and then also people at the local bars, there is likely going to be an officer there who's gonna be monitoring the activity when people 
believe those bars because we found in the past that sometimes there ends up being problems. There's fights. Um, perhaps you heard on the news not too long ago, there, there was an incident with, uh, with a guy who was going up and down Duran Avenue trying to people trying to set people's hair on fire which is r r really um just bizarre um but i mean that that's that's a that's a real concern you know anytime you have a commercial district and there's lots of people in the area it, it is something that requires um, some 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 police assistance oftentimes does, does that does that all make sense uh yes <clears throat> okay. I see a question here about our morale. Let's see, Captain Schofield, or sure. it's a, 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 the question was how is morale? It's a tough question to answer because a lot of it depends upon not only the individual, but where the individual is working. Uh, morale can be a very individual thing. However, it is absolutely a very tough time to be a police officer. In 24 years, this is certainly the roughest I've ever seen it. Uh, so that does have effect on officers' morale. It has effect on uh, their, their personal lives, and then that can bleed over into the family. So it's something we try and do what we can to control through wellness and uh, things like time off and get granting officers training uh, and resources. But morale is, is in any organization a tough thing to monitor. I think if you were to ask everybody in this room, they would have a different perspective because a lot of times it has to do with physically where you happen to be at that point uh, in time. But it, I will say it is very tough time to be a cop right now. Uh, and so that in, its, in itself has a as a bearing on morale, but we have a, a, a very good agency um, and we're doing our best to, to try and keep morale up, but it, it definitely has, uh, it ebbs and flows for sure. All right. I see we have another question here. Um, I'm very concerned about the homeless situations, particularly the RVs, vans, and cars that live on Bolivar. I'm upset at all the garbage around and in the lake, the waste, food, and human that gets thrown in the water, the needles strewn throughout the park and in the water, dog feces everywhere. Can the police clear that area out? How can we as citizens help if needed? Hartley, if you could say a few words. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, great question to whoever asked that because it's, uh, Nonetheless, it's frustrating to see that. It's sad to see it. Uh, we are well aware of it, uh, but right now we are currently, well, we are working with the council and city government to address or see how we can address it. Um, so right now I don't really have a, an answer for you because we are working with the city to come up with uh, BMCs, enforcing the Berkeley Municipal Codes or other penal codes that are in effect addressing issues that are around Boulevard, uh, South Aquatic and North Aquatic. So we are well aware of it. Uh, I agree with everything you said. It is at times very disgusting down there. Uh, it's just a, it's a process right now, working with the city council and uh, for us to do something. So we are aware of it. We are trying to get, uh, I've worked with uh, Lieutenant Files before with getting parking enforcement down there, RVs down there that are longer than 72 hours. Uh, I've been down there personally, talked to folks. I've also got people through the city to go down there with me, uh, talk to some folks that may, may or may not have been in an RV. Uh, we've tried to offer housing and other resources. So we are, we are going down there, uh, at, but I was down there today and it does look like there's not a whole lot going on. So I do apologize for it, but we are working with what we have and it's, uh, it's really tough right now, especially down there. And uh, due to COVID, we did slow down on some things that we were doing. Uh, prior to COVID, we were doing some enforcement, doing a, we were very active in what we were doing down at well, all, along, all along the whole city. But the boulevard was uh, 
we were doing a lot more and due to COVID, we had some restrictions that we had to take into consideration for some of the unhoused folks. And it was recommended not to move folks around. So some of them are still there. We're still going through the pandemic, uh, but we are well aware of what is going on and we're trying to do what we can. May I add a little something to that? As the officer just said, we were working quite a few programs with this before COVID. So I, I would implore you to talk to your elected to let them know that uh, despite the pandemic, you have concerns and that you want to see them move forward with some actions so that they can enable us to take care of your, of your request and, and the things that you deem important. Um, because just last night in the mayor's address uh, to the state of the city, uh, he specifically said he didn't want people who were asked to shelter in place and vehicles to be moved along. So those, those things need to be counterweight and counterbalanced and it needs to have a, a conversation above the pay grade of police officers, but in the policy makers of the city, so they can direct us what to do. Yeah, if I can mention uh, a few other things too. Um, so in addition to what Brian was saying and uh, Lieutenant Files, the city is actively working on finding a location for an RV sanctioned site. Um, they're not just looking within the city, but they're also taking a regional approach as well. Cause as most of you are aware, <clears throat> our city, is at a premium for space. Um, so it's awfully difficult to find a location that's gonna be able to satisfy um, a large number of RVs. Um, I'd also like to add that uh, we do understand that the concerns and obviously the, the blight and the public health and safety hazards that are associated with encampments um, and the RV dwellers within our city. Um, and CSB, we currently conduct weekly cleanups with our parks department in addition to our public works department uh, where we collaborate with them um, and we also collaborate with our outreach workers, so our homeless outreach and treatment teams to link these unhoused individuals with outreach and other type of uh, shelters and services. So we do take a housing first approach, but we also understand the concerns uh, related to the hazards associated with the unhoused. I'd just like to add one more thing and some of the challenges in dealing with some of the uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness. Uh, as, as residents may not be aware that a few years ago, the Ninth Circuit uh, dealt localities and jurisdictions a pretty tough blow in that they're, they're, they're not able to enforce lodging on public property. So you see uh, in the past many uh, homeless uh, encampments, the, you know, the police would be involved and there would be tools that the police would use, uh, whether it's a citation uh, and or if there are continued problems, uh, sometimes even an arrest. But uh, we're not able to do that anymore because really the courts have said, hey, uh, you know, you have to have a place for, for these folks to go. And, uh, you know, in order to enforce uh, lodging on public property, we have to have shelter space for these folks to go. And right now, as uh, Acting Lieutenant Rodriguez said, uh, you know, space is a, at a premium. And so our shelters, especially right now due to COVID, that's a whole separate thing, but even prior to COVID, uh, we don't have a whole lot of shelter space in Berkeley. And if, again, if we don't have a place for them to go, we're not able to enforce some of these, some of these laws. And so that's, that's a part of it. I just wanted to chime in with that info. Uh, we also, I see another question here. Uh, can add, the... Brian, can I add another thing here? Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, so, yeah, in addition to the, the Boise decision, we're obviously also impacted by the fact that we're in a shelter in place. Um, so the city has um, basically created some leeway in allowing citizens to um, maintain their tents and have encampments throughout the city. But there are three conditions that we are enforcing um, encampments and enforcing tents in that the city manager has made it clear to us that we are allowed to remove tents and individuals that are camped out on medians that are blocking um, ADA access and any right of way issues as well. So yeah, we're actively working on those if and when they appear. And then Byron, I see someone else put a question in there. It looks like it's piggybacking kind of on the same, uh, same topic. <clears throat> So if you guys haven't seen it, it's uh, on the homeless RV issue, maybe a dumb question, but until the new RV park is ready, 
is there more we can do to provide the encampments with trash pickup service? Uh, is it an issue of access to dumpsters? Are they simply not used? Um, so we have been routinely, routinely working with Public Works uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays of every week. Uh, we've let a lot of the individuals know in certain areas where they can put their pile of trash uh, if there's not a dumpster already down there and it's being picked up weekly. Uh, if it does get, uh, if there's a lot of trash or completely overwhelmed, Public Works knows to go down there even on an off day and pick it up. So we do, to answer your question about the uh, trash, we are doing that currently. We've been doing that for some months now. Uh, some of the dumpsters have been placed around the city uh, strategically. And one of the issues that we run into with that is uh, abuse of the dumpsters, whether it's, uh, you know, it's, it's intended for some of the unhoused folks to use, but what we found in our hearing is people are doing illegal dumping there uh, and other things. So it's not being, used for what it's intended for, which is to help with the trash issue. So we are working on it as well. Uh, and both of those are being dealt with. We do pick up trash and dumpsters are being, being and have been placed strategically around the city to help with the trash. <clears throat> All right. I see a question here in the comments. Are, are we, are the Berkeley giving too much warnings without citations to people on drugs? When my brother was a UC Berkeley frat boy, he would get fined whenever there was a party. After 10 p.m., why don't people on drugs get citations for making noise after 10 p.m.? Why do the middle class only get in trouble? Okay. Um, I don't know that we can talk about all the social issues, but um, uh, I was thinking perhaps uh, Jessica Perry, if you could talk just a little bit about uh, just how some of the enforcement that happens up on uh, Piedmont or the, fr the fraternity area and our cooperation with the university. Yeah, no problem. Um, so uh, as we've previously stated, now is a very difficult time due to COVID. So I think right now, more than anything else, we're dealing with doing more education than we are doing enforcement. Um, so most of what we've been doing as far as in regards to parties in the South Campus area is is given more education. Uh, we actually haven't issued any second responses uh, during COVID or actually at this year at all, which might be in that that might be what you're referring to in regards to the frat parties. That's usually a second response violation. Um, we have not given any of those during COVID. Does that kind of partially answer that question? Um, well, it, I, <clears throat> it's it's in the, it's in the comments here, so it sounds uh, it sounds like that. That's uh, the answer there. And I also see a comment here from someone asking about the picture of confiscated guns in Berkeleyside. They all seem to be Glocks. A little more investigation and the appear to be ghost guns. And Way posted on Twitter, weather report for Berkeley, it's raining Glocks. Yes, I, I saw that on Twitter as well. Um, it just so happens that Many of the guns that we've recovered recently have been Glocks. Um, so just uh, answering that. Let's see, we have another question here for Officer Perry. Please describe the boundaries of your area. Is it larger than when Officer Tinney was responsible for that area? Hi again. Um, so my, my boundaries of South Campus go from the UC campus uh, south all the way to the Oakland border. So as far east as the city of Berkeley goes. And there's some interesting lines in the middle, but essentially it goes as far west as we can say Shattuck and Adeline, depending on the area. And it is the same coverage I did take over for Officer Tenney to answer your question, how the boundary lines haven't changed. So if I could just add to that and see if I can uh, share the screen also, but you can give me a moment here. 
And Byron, can you in that screen share do the one that includes our phone numbers? Because it doesn't allow us to provide those to everybody in the chat because there isn't a normal chat feature. So we have to send them privately. Okay. Let me try this one first. So with the City of Berkeley uh, GIS portal, you can actually go in and uh, see the different areas for the air coordinators. Uh, this is Officer Perry's area. This is area three, area four, and then area one. And let me go to our community services page. Just one moment. Share the screen. So here again, you can see our, our map. This is our Community Services Bureau page, and you can see the different areas that the different area coordinators are responsible for, as well as their, as well as their telephone numbers. And there's pictures, nice pictures of us all there. Well, we still need to update our site. Okay. Um, but that is, that answers that question. <clears throat> well, uh, yes. Hey, Byron. Yes. I can interject. Uh, we've had the chief join us as well. Hello, chief. So the chief would like to say a few things or. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was uh, not able to come to the early part of the meeting. I appreciate participation of uh, the folks on the screen here and those who are in our attendees as well and who have been here. Hopefully it's been an interesting discussion. We hear some good information going out uh, about the air coordinators and the work they're doing. And um, hope that this will be the first of a kind of ongoing um, work to, uh, to connect the community through uh, technology while we have to deal with the effects of COVID. I'd much rather be standing outside a cafe somewhere having a cup of coffee with everybody, but thanks for putting it together. I appreciate it. Well, let's see, we have a question here from Mr. Denton. All right, you are now allowed to speak. Hello. Um, <clears throat> Chief uh, Greenwood, uh, I wanted to ask you about what appears to be a kind of new paradigm in policing. A few weeks ago, you had a uh, gentleman who was apprehended uh, shoplifting uh, a few grocery bags of uh, cosmetics from uh, uh, North of Berkeley and uh, <clears throat> an officer uh, arrested him and he seemed to realize that there was like no chance that he was going to be shot so he started uh, jumping around like he was gonna run and um, <clears throat> she had him get in the car which he did start and uh, uh, drove uh, almost uh, um, <laughs> uh, assaulting her and uh, then I understand he was he was out of out of jail uh, after a few minutes the next day. So uh, is is that the new paradigm where you know you you talked about the uh, larceny, and and so people those uh, committing those crimes know that uh, they can just uh, run away, right? Well, there's a couple of uh, pieces in that. Um, the fact of the matter is since uh, in terms of people remaining in custody for nonviolent crimes, uh, since the outbreak of COVID and the emphasis on um, trying to control for COVID infection and risk in uh, jails and, and prisons, um, the uh, California Judicial Council created a very low or no bail schedule for uh, all nonviolent crimes. And so it's been a frustrating thing for us that, um, that um, uh, officers can make arrests uh, but they have to release them in the field or bring them here to the station, perhaps to book them, but the bail is one cent, um, for example. Uh, and so that would include, for example, a shoplifting, uh, shoplifting case where um, um, actually we'll be citing them out in the field most likely for that. Uh, it also includes a range of um, narcotics offenses, 
uh, even in some offenses that are really, really causing us as a community to have a problem. For example, uh, catalytic converter thieves. Um, we recently had a, what, what our arrests in those have occurred when either um, someone calls in the early morning hours to report a suspicious circumstance and our officer shows up um, or they describe a vehicle and the officer stops the vehicle. Um, I believe last week or the week before we had just a sharp-eyed officer actually spot um, a thieves in progress, um, taking out catalytic converters <clears throat> at like four in the morning, stop them. I believe there are two suspects and maybe three catalytic converters in the backseat of the car. And, um, and the bail was, I believe, three cents. <laughs> uh, and so um, it's, really, it's really challenging. I know the hard work of the folks, many on the screen, their coordinators, and the, uh, in particular, um, Sergeant Kasalik and uh, the downtown task force, what is now our bike patrol. Uh, they do a lot of work um, uh, for um, a lot of work to try and impact um, people whose behaviors are threatening um, and, um, and who commit uh, often kind of the, I'll, I'll say quote unquote minor crimes, but it's challenging because they're not staying in uh, custody. So the accountability is really undermined right now. And that's just a challenge we have to deal with until the Judicial Council uh, resumes its previous bail schedule where at least some people will be held in custody for longer periods of time. That low bail also applies to um, stolen vehicles, I believe, and I'll bet actually some of the people on this call can tell more stories than I can about uh, crimes where normally somebody was booked in a jail with a significant bail, uh, but because of the current bail schedule, uh, they're released right away. That's a problem. Uh, and not to be uh, too wordy, but that also has, there's also a, um, a piece that the public isn't really aware of which is that our detectives will um, investigate crimes like burglary, um, burglary, auto burglary, a uh, series of auto burglaries, um, thefts, even catalytic converter thefts, where they uh, develop probable cause to make an arrest and they seek what's called a Ramey warrant. And that's a, that's a, a judge saying, okay, I'm, I'm saying you do have probable cause for the arrest. Let's put a warrant in the system uh, so that the arrest can be made. As an investigator, this allows, the, the idea is that the suspect's arrested the investigators notified and then they have a chance to interview that person, obtain further evidence, perhaps obtain evidence from their cellular phone and so forth. But the problem is that these Remy warrants are going out, I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm asking our, our folks here, but um, the, the bail could be a penny. So yeah, the person gets arrested, the detective gets notified, but the person's out of custody before the detectives have had a chance to uh, further their investigation through interview. So um, it, it is a very challenging set of circumstances for us. Um, and um, uh, uh, yeah, it, it is a challenge. Hey, Chief, uh, you know, let me just give you like a little bit of slice. Like this is from the bike team. This is one officer, happens to be the officer of the year. I was just talking to him. Uh, this was just today, right? So he, he um, you know, just doing his bike patrol, roll, rolling around downtown. Um, so he happened to stop one individual um, that was on probation, right? So did a probation search. He has, he had some drugs on him. He had some uh, methamphetamine. He's also on probation for fraud, right? So that's a, a bigger crime than the, the mere possession, but typically we could take that person to jail. And at least they'd spend a few days in jails off of our street, out of our downtown, away from, you know, potential victims. Well, today, we, because of COVID and the conditions that are, that are put before us, we, we can't. So we, we let that person go who normally, because of probation, we, we just uh, take him to jail. Now, now we just give him a citation to release him to go get more drugs, steal more stuff. Like, it's, like we can't just sit there and monitor him. That's one person. It's the same officer about an hour later stops another guy who's on pr uh, parole, right? Um, that guy, same thing, was in possession of uh, a meth pipe. And, uh, you know, parole, th those people are watched uh, more seriously. But again, we, they, they will not take those people into jail. So you have, you know, basically large scale criminals walking around that we normally we could have put in jail, at least get them out of the system of, you know, victimizing people. And now they're just, you know, all we can do is give them a citation and let them go. The, the, the system won't take them. That's, that's uh, as the chief said, like th those are the problems that we're dealing with on a day to day basis. I appreciate your uh, coming to this event, Mr. Gantley. All right. <clears throat> um, 
it looks like uh, there's no more raised hands, so um, I think that uh, maybe we could uh, end for this evening. If there's anything else, anyone else wanted, anything else one of the other panelists wanted to share. Um, but otherwise, uh, this is something that um, is good, and we hope to have more of these in the future. And uh, we thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you, uh, Byron. Thanks, Dr. Rodriguez, and thanks for everybody for being on this. I appreciate it. Look forward to the next one and hopefully some caffeine in hand. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right. Bye.